For Krima Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today to discuss the progress in international reading literacy study is Associate Professor of Economics Department in Stellenbosch University, Nick Spall. Professor, can you briefly comment uh, on the recent key findings that revealed uh, that in 2021, 81% of grade four learners cannot read for meaning in any language. And also tell us what does this mean for the South African education system? This was a survey of children's reading abilities in South Africa called the Progress in International Reading Literacy Study or PEARLS. And the study is done every five years. So the last time the study was done was in 2016. And the most recent one, which is the one we're talking about now, was done in 2021 after the pandemic. So we knew that there was a crisis in reading even before the pandemic, because in 2016, about 78% of grade fours could not read in any language, and all 11 languages were tested. But now, in 2021, that's increased to 81% of children that can't read in any language. So South Africa is only one of 50 countries that are participating in the study, and we came last of all of the countries that participated. And we also had the largest decline uh, between 2016 and 2021. So I think what this is pointing to is that we have serious problems uh, with the teaching of reading in South African schools and that things are actually getting worse as a result of the pandemic. These findings have taken us back to 2011 levels of achievement. What would it take uh, to improve to at least reasonable figures given that our basic education department has no catch-up plan in place? So I think what you mentioned there is a really important one, that we don't currently have a plan. Um, so there's no current national reading plan. There's no budget for this. And I think if you don't have a plan and you don't have a budget, there's not going to be any progress. So I think the three main components of a plan uh, would be making sure that every single foundation phase classroom in the country is equipped with a minimum set of resources. So teachers, uh, in the same way you can't learn how to play soccer without a football, uh, without a, a soccer ball, you can't learn to read without books uh, and, and specific kinds of books, not just any books. You need mm -hmm. graded readers that sort of structure things in a phonically sequenced way so that the stories go from easy to hard uh, and they need to be grade appropriate. Um, they also need to be cognizant of the way that a language is structured. So if you think of a, a language like Sepedi or Sasutu, it's written down very differently to Isizulu or Isidebele or Siswati, uh, which have much lo lots of long words whereas the Sutu languages have lots of short words. And helping children to be able to decode and understand the, the languages that they're reading and the languages that they speak is really important. So that's the first one is resources. The second one is we have to retrain our teachers. So most teachers in South Africa were actually trained under apartheid. So more than 50% of teachers uh, are 50 years or older, which means that they're going to retire in the next 10 to 15 years. But it also means that they were trained under apartheid. Um, and they weren't taught on the specifics of how you actually teach children to read. So if we take you, for example, just because you can read or I can read doesn't mean necessarily that we can teach someone how to read. Uh, there's a very specific knowledge that you need to teach children how to read. It's not rocket science, but it's not as if anyone can do it. And at the moment, most of our teachers don't actually know how to teach reading. Uh, so they would need to be retrained. And then lastly, you would need an assessment. So if you don't have an assessment testing uh, each, if each and every school in the country at, for example, the grade three level, we wouldn't be able to figure out which are the schools that need the most support uh, and which are the ones that we need to monitor most closely. So if you think of in January every year when the matric results come out, there's a huge jamboree about the matric results, which province came best, which one is declining, is the pass rate going up, is the pass rate going down? We don't have any of that conversation about early grade reading. And part of that is because we don't have a test at the primary school level, a standardized test that every single school participates in, like every single high school writes matric. We only actually have that in the Western Cape where there's a test for every grade three, every grade six, and every grade nine. But for the other eight provinces, we don't have those. Who is to blame? I'm less interested in sort of trying to figure out who's to blame for this. I think that there's um, a lot of people and a lot of decisions that were made that led to it. I think school closures and rotational timetables at the beginning of the pandemic made sense uh, when we didn't know, you know, were children going to die from COVID? How infectious was it? You know, all of those unknown questions. At the start of the pandemic in 2020, I think everyone agreed we needed to close schools. 
But even the Ministerial Advisory Committee, halfway through 2021, advised the minister and the department to open schools and let all children go back to schools because the harms to children, the cognitive harms, what the learning losses, the socio-emotional harm of not being at school, the nutritional harm of not getting a free school meal because you're only coming to school every second day, those harms outweigh the benefits of social distancing. But still, the minister and the department continued with rotational timetables for another six months, and we only ended the rotational timetables in 2022. So I do think that that contributed to the learning losses that we see. But the other other main contributing factor is we still don't have a catch-up plan, right? So we still don't have a plan for how we're going to make up these losses that we've seen. Uh, you know, extraordinary times require extraordinary measures. And we're not doing that. We're just seeing business as usual. Let's just carry on, go back to normal schooling, same number of hours in the day. And I think that's a big problem. Would you agree with the Democratic Alliance? I recently interviewed their uh, shadow minister for basic education who said, uh, given these results, uh, the minister as well as uh, I think her DG should be summoned to parliament to present a plan because it is really important. Yeah, I think that is a completely reasonable request. Um, I mean, we live in a parliamentary democracy where the minister... Uh, yes, she's appointed by the ruling party, but the ruling party is accountable to parliament. Um, so I think it's completely within the rights of the par- parliamentary portfolio committee to summon the minister and the DG and ask them, what is the catch-up plan? What is the national reading plan? Where is the budget for catching this up? So I think, yeah, I think that's a completely reasonable thing to do. And it's a reasonable thing as South Africans to expect the minister to have a plan um, and, to, and to bring us into her confidence and tell, her, tell us what that plan is. So the average Brazilian grade four child is three years ahead of the average South African grade four child. What are the methods, if you are aware uh, of them, Professor, that are used in Brazil that maybe could benefit our country? So Brazil is a very large country and, and similar to South Africa, it's broken into provinces, although they call them states. And it was a big shocking finding to find out that, you know, the average South African grade four is three years behind the average Brazilian grade four, as you said. Uh, Another way of saying that is is, is only 19% of grade fours in South Africa could read, whereas in Brazil, it was three times higher, 61% uh, of Brazilian grade fours could read. And I think your question about what is Brazil doing that we're not doing is maybe another way of saying, you know, what are the lessons that we can learn from Brazil? And one of the the states in Brazil uh, called Serra is one of the poorest states. And over the last 20 years, they've actually, even though they are one of the poorest states, the equivalent of like Eastern Cape or Limpopo in South Africa, but in Brazil, and they managed to focus, ruthless focus on reading. And for over 20 years, they t- completely turned the state around. Um, and now it's one of the best performing states, even though it's still a relatively poor state. It's not like it became a rich state and then uh, the reading results improved. And that was a relentless focus on reading. Uh, they made sure that all of the uh, municipal and sort of the finances at the local level were linked to the outcomes and the reading outcomes that were being achieved in that level uh, and that they measured, uh, consistently measured reading over time so that everyone knew this is the goal that we're moving towards in every single school. And a lot of people also emphasize political leadership and political will. So that's critical factors, you know, unless you've got someone at the top saying, this is a priority, this is absolutely the number one thing we have to do um, it's unlikely that it's uh, it, it will last and stand the test of time. Professor, I know a family that enrolled uh, their kids in a private school uh, in the foundation phase, and then they later change and enroll their kids at a public school uh, from maybe grade 10 uh, up to 12, because they believe that a, a good foundation phase is necessary. So would you encourage that uh, to those who can afford that? So, I mean, I think your friend, uh, I think, is very wise in the sense of recognizing that the foundations for a child's life are built early. You know, it's not in grade 10 and grade 11 that you, you, it, the decision and the effort is made to make sure that your child gets into university. If you've messed up the foundations of your house and you're now talking about building the roof, uh, you're not going to build a, a successful house. I can understand the logic of why they're doing that. I think the problem, though, is that only about 5 or 6% of South African children are in private schools. It's a very small percentage. And then another probably 10 to 15% are in fee-charging public schools, mm-hmm. uh, Model C schools or just fee-charging uh, public schools. For parents that can afford to send their children to fee-charging schools and they perceive the quality of education to be higher in those schools, which is true, yes, they should 
And if you say, I can only send my child, if someone asked me for advice and they said, I can only send my child for five years of schooling in a, a, a private school or a fee charging school, which five years would you pick? Yes, I would pick um, grade one to five. You talk about recruiting, uh, training, as well as equipping youth to be teacher assistants. Is this not going to confuse the learners when the teachers and assistants maybe use different teaching methods? So that recommendation is based on a study from Limpopo. Um, the organization is called Funda One Day, and they ran a big study in 120 schools in Limpopo. And 40 of the schools got given extra materials and teaching assistance and training. 40 of the schools got given extra materials and training uh, and only centralized training. So they didn't get teaching assistance. And then 40 of the schools were just business as usual, just carried on as per normal. And what they found was that as long as the unemployed youth got given training, this is about four days of face-to-face -face training per term, every single learner got their own workbook and every teacher got their own teacher guide. And each of those youths uh, was was supported by what was called a teaching assistant mentor, a TA mentor. And the training, the training wasn't only of the teaching assistant. The training was of the teacher assistant and the teacher, both together. So it's not as if they would be saying different things. You know, both the teacher and the teaching assistant were trained on how do you use this workbook to teach children to read. And then the teaching assistant would basically support the teacher with classroom management or maybe helping with the weakest learners in the class and working with them in a small group. There are various ways that you can use teaching assistants. But I think unless you recruit the teaching assistants properly, so they had to write a numeracy and a literacy test before they could be hired. And unless you train them and support them, I think then you're not going to see the effect. Uh, just dropping in unemployed youth into schools is not going to have an effect. They have to be trained and they have to be selected and supported. The Eastern Cape has rolled out uh, anthologies of, of great readers, uh, which is a set of 20 sequence stories uh, aimed at teaching children to read in their home language uh, to all grade one to three children from 2019 uh, to 2020. And it seems to have produced remarkable results. Tell us about that. Sure. So when you teach children to read, um, it's very it's very useful if you can have books that are structured and sequenced in a way that they start from very easy. In English, we might think of a, a word like cat or rat or sat or, you know, uh, the cat mm -hmm. sat on the mat. It's, these are all very easy to read words, right? Um, before you start coming up with very long and complicated words. So that would be an example of a graded reader. So a story, a set of stories, story one, story two, story three, all the way up to story 22, where they get incrementally more and more difficult as you go up. So what the Eastern Cape did was instead of having each one of those little books as its own, what we call skinny books, tiny little thin book, which are quite expensive to print, they put all of them into one book, which is called an anthology. So all 22 of those stories were in one book. And the reason why it became quite cheap to print is because the main printing cost for books is the cover. So if you only have one cover, uh, then you're only paying once uh, instead of paying for 22 books for each child. So they ended up only costing 15 rand per anthology and each child got their own anthology that they got to keep and take home. So they rolled this out in 2019 and 2020 uh, for all of their Isikosa and Susutu schools in the Eastern Cape. And what we found when we evaluated it was after this, this period, after two years, that children's Isikosa reading abilities had gone up uh, compared to children in the same schools the previous years that didn't get the reading books. Um, unfortunately, the Eastern Cape then scrapped, they stopped doing it for 2021, 22, uh, and now 23 because they had rolled out this tablet program for matrix and they ran out of money. So even though it's actually a really cheap uh, intervention and it's really successful uh, and it could be distributed to all, all children in the country, um, for a very, you know, I think some estimates were between 50 and 70 million rand. So it's, it's, a, it's very unfortunate that we haven't done that, but that is definitely a policy solution that we should be thinking about. Some parents are also encouraged to help their children with homework. Would you now uh, say that if the department had to ask uh, us now as parents to play a larger role in homework, then maybe this situation of, of, of reading could also improve? So I do think that parents should be involved with their children's uh, reading. And I think they can read to their children. They can read themselves and show their children that reading is important, that it's an enjoyable activity. They can ask their children what books they want to read, if they have books that are available. 
But also we must remember that the constitutional mandate uh, of the department is to teach children to read. It's not parents' responsibility to teach their children to read. The reason why we send our children to school from Monday to Friday for six hours a day, why? Is so that they can learn how to read, how they can do, to learn to do maths, those kinds of things. So yes, I'm not saying that parents don't have a role to play. They do. But the primary role, the primary responsibility for teaching children to read is at the school and with the teacher. Uh, and I don't think we should shirk that by saying, oh, it's a whole of society uh, responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's primarily the teacher in the school, in the classroom. That's why we send our kids to school. There was Associate Professor of Economics Department at Stellenbosch University, Nick Spall, in conversation with Polity discussing the progress in international reading literacy studies.